Hi, welcome to hashtag CR Arthritis at the Canadian Rheumatology Association and Arthritis Health Professions Association annual scientific meeting. My name is Maya Joshi and I'm the program coordinator at Arthritis Consumer Experts. I am joined today by Dr. Jonathan Chan, who is leading a session at the CRA meeting this Friday on non-radiographic axial spondylitis diagnosis and management. Welcome to our program, Dr. Chan, and thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for inviting me. So um, we have had the pleasure of having you on our program before, but for any new audience members, can you briefly tell us a bit about yourself and how you are involved in rheumatology? So I'm a rheumatologist here in Vancouver, BC. I mostly do clinical practice, but I do uh, participate in some research, particularly in axial spa and uh, psoriatic arthritis. I did my uh, training here in Vancouver, but then I uh, also went to Toronto to uh, learn from uh, some, some, some of the best. I, I don't want to uh, give a hierarchy. I might offend some people. So <laughs> definitely some of the best uh, out there. And, uh, and they've kind of uh, given me some of their wisdom over the years. Um, and so right now I uh, participate with uh, SPARC, which is a Canadian research consortium and, and Spartan um, participate a little bit with, with ASAS and GRAPA uh, and some of the other uh, research groups there. Right, great. And so um, in terms of the session that you're going to be uh, presenting at this Friday, can you explain for us what non-radiographic axial spondylitis is and how this differs from uh, other types of arthritis that folks might be more familiar with, like ankylosing spondylitis? Yeah, so ankylosing spondylitis, um, it's you know, inflammatory condition that can affect the spine and usually starts in young people. Uh, but, you know, when it first came, I, when we started recognizing it, and it's a very old disease. I mean, we've seen, we have evidence of it in mummies, right? Um, so uh, part of the definition in 1984 was, or the classification criteria, I should say, was x-ray changes, evidence of inflammation seen on x-ray. But, you know, x-rays are just casting shadows on a wall and, you know, the quality of the image is pretty poor. And even since that first definition, we've known that a lot of people kind of have that flavor, right? So they took patients who were first degree relatives of those who had classic ankylosing spondylitis. And a lot of them had the gene or the history and it sounded like they had stiffness and it's better with activity, uh, but they didn't have x-ray changes. So, um, you know, over the years, we've discovered that uh, some patients will evolve towards that classic ankylosing spondylitis with x-ray evidence of sacroiliitis other people may not, uh, or you maybe you're catching them early. And, and you know, we don't want to wait 10 years before someone gets uh, definite evidence on x-ray before we start treating someone or, uh, you know, start uh, giving them uh, some prognosis there. So uh, nowadays we are utilizing other imaging tools uh, like MRI. And, uh, you know, sometimes people just have a strong clinical suspicion, like they've got the gene, they got uveitis, they got a hot swollen knee, They've got enthesitis, their CRP is elevated. You know, it, it's, uh, it sounds like a duck and it looks like a duck and it <laughs> quacks like a duck. So, you know, maybe it indeed is a duck. <laughs> right, okay, so so essentially there isn't um, evidence on an X-ray, but there's mm -hmm. other things which are. Yeah. Okay, so then um, in the case of that form of the disease, non-radiographic axial spondylitis, what are the main challenges related then to diagnosis and or treatment mm -hmm. in that disease area? You know, I think the, the big challenge is that low back pain, which is the main symptom, is super common. Uh, you know, some studies say 20 to 5 to 30% of all people, regardless of the age, have chronic low back pain. And so when you're dealing with just a huge percent of the population, um, and it's, it's, it's sometimes hard to distinguish um, whether it's, you know, kind of nonspecific back pain or if it is inflammatory. And we often use, you know, B27 testing or uh, MRI uh, to help clinch that diagnosis. But, you know, it, it would be impractical to MRI every single person with chronic low back pain, uh, I think, uh, you know, and serially MRI them, right? And so I think, especially in certain areas, there may not be access to MRI. And so that poses a challenge there. Um, and, you know, there is some question as whether or not some of these changes can be transient. And so if you, um, as I kind of mentioned, you don't want to be MRIing everyone like every six months to, to make sure you capture that, uh, that condition. So that's some of the challenges uh, that are probably one of the bigger challenges, access to imaging 
uh, when clinching that diagnosis. Right, and I have heard that, um, I'm not sure which category of spondyloarthritis this fits into, but I have heard mm -hmm. that there can be up to 10 years um, uh, difference between when symptoms start and then when a diagnosis is made. Yeah, that's the, the most, uh, I mean, on average, uh, from when symptoms start to when someone is diagnosed with uh, with uh, ankylosing spondylitis or AXPA, um, the average delay is 10 years, and it tends to be longer for females. Uh, females tend to have less uh, X-ray changes, so they less of them will eventually get X-ray changes, and and so that's why we, when you look at people who just have X-ray changes, it tends to be more male, but once you factor in MRI and and you know elevated. Uh, CRPs, um, and that can be a bit challenging with, with elevated CRPs just because it's a fairly non-specific test. And so you just have to be cautious about overcalling things uh, with that. But once you in fact those other uh, modalities, then the prevalence in females is, is a lot higher. Right, right. And, um, and then is there any new information or any way that we can sort of overcome those uh, diagnosis issues? You know, We've tried to develop uh, kind of a rapid access uh, spa clinic in, in Vancouver. Uh, I had a physiotherapist, an ACPAC trained physiotherapist who was helping me out. Um, unfortunately, um, she uh, went back to the dark side of Ontario. Uh, so <laughs> I'm in the process of uh, still looking for, for that support. Uh, thankfully, I have a good connections with a lot of the, the gastroenterologists, the dermatologists, the ophthalmologists here in Vancouver. And so uh, that is kind of a low hanging fruit, right? Because about in the course of their disease, about 40% of patients will have what we call an extra articular manifestation, right? So if they have a history of uveitis and low back pain and they're young, I mean, that should be an automatic referral to an ophthalmol uh, to a rheumatologist. Mm -hmm. And in a lot of centers, ophthalmology just doesn't think about that because they're, you know, plowing through patients. And so um, I've spoken to the uh, BC Ophthalmology Association and um, and thankfully, they've been very receptive. Um, and to some degree, they don't have to think about it. They say, just send it, John. <laughs> so that, that's uh, kind of good for them and, and also help to identify patients early. Right, great. Um, and then I know that you, you of course, haven't uh, done this session yet, but I'm wondering if you can provide us with any highlights or key messages that you will be covering in your upcoming session. Well, I'm, I'm going to talk a bit about imaging. I'm trying not to overemphasize imaging. I mean, Walter Maximovich talks a lot about imaging, and I'll try to um, give some highlights, some, some broad overview of that, and also other aspects as well. But, but I think the way that I tell our trainees in, in Vancouver is that um, imaging is important and helpful, but it's not, it's not the be-all and end-all. And you know, oftentimes, it's not 100%. Like, sometimes you do the MRI and it's a slam dunk. The tons of erosions, floored bone marrow edema, um, and that is helpful. But a lot of the times it's, you know, there's a little bit of edema. It's not 100%. You're kind of in this gray zone and you have to um, utilize the clinical components to, uh, to uh, come up with a convincing diagnosis there. Right. Okay. So you'll be sort of um, talking about that, that issue and maybe then explaining those clinical those mm -hmm. Yeah, clinical correlation is required. That, that, <laughs> that's what the radiologists often say. So, Right, great. I mean, it's interesting. I feel like that is something, uh, those issues maybe exist across rheumatic disease areas. Like I know in rheumatoid arthritis, uh, not everybody's um, inflammation will show up on a blood test, but mm -hmm. then there's still other signs and things. Totally, yes, yes. Great. Um, okay, well then lastly, um, I'm wondering if there are any lifestyle or self-management tips that you can offer um, our patients who are living with non-radiographic axial spondylitis or mm -hmm. spondylitis. I mean, we try to encourage all, all patients with arthritis to be remain active. I think there's a big emphasis within uh, AXPA for core strengthening exercises uh, and just patients with low back pain in general. I think one of the challenges is there's often not access to uh, physiotherapy. Mm -hmm. And so um, we, we have, you know, thankfully Mary Pack Arthritis Center, they have, you know, if they have a diagnosis of, of ankylosing spondylitis or AXPA, they can get free access to physio. But a lot of patients live uh, far out, you know, far in the interior, um, or maybe they don't have AXPA, but they still have low back pain. So thankfully, you know, there's a lot of uh, online resources. I found some good YouTube videos and I just send those out on email to patients. 
and I say, well, try this for, you know, 15 minutes every day, make it like brushing your teeth, just do it all the time and give it three months. And if it's still really bad, then, then we can talk about other options. Uh, that in addition to maintaining weight is another big aspect that, you know, you can take control of and, and um, have some impact on. Um, thankfully, there's a lot of general internists here in uh, Vancouver who have extra training in uh, obesity medicine. And so uh, they, they've been very helpful. I've had a lot of patients have good success with, with some degree of weight loss. Um, and then, you know, smoking, of course, is just bad for everything. So, so don't smoke. <laughs> Yeah. Right. And um, sorry to put you on the spot here, but um, you were just talking about those sort of online resources that are available. Mm -hmm. Can you think of any um, just off the top of your head that we could maybe? <clears throat> yeah. Well, right now, actually, with uh, Spark, we're, we're piloting a project called We Got Your Back, and it's an educational series in addition to exercise videos. Um, that's not full fledged yet. I think we're still testing and seeing whether it makes a difference between um, those who just kind of. Um, are given no direction and those who are give, kind of given this online program. Um, there are a lot of good, so the, there's all YouTube channels that, that I just said, physiotherapy exercise for low back pain. And I, I, I sh maybe shouldn't necessarily promote one over the other, but I think a lot of physiotherapists post a lot of good material. It's not necessarily specific to ankylosing spondylitis, but I think a lot of patients with low back pain would likely benefit from some degree of stretching and strengthening. All right, great. Well, it sounds like there's some great resources out there and that uh, what you're also developing with Spark will be something that we can look forward to. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Chen I'll give the credit to Laura, La okay. Laura Pressalon. She, it's, her, it's her main project. I'm, I'm supporting her, so I, I don't want to take credit for that one. <laughs> okay, great. Well, uh, Dr. Chen, thank you so much for being on our program today. Um, I'm looking forward to attending your session on Friday, and um, I can't wait to learn more about the topic then. Perfect. Thanks for inviting me.